seminar. I'm uh, I'm one of the uh, editors on the journal. Um, and before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to um, to explain how, how how if you have questions, you can ask those questions. You can either enter those questions into the chat box, or if you raise your it, during the presentation, or if at the end of the presentation when we ask questions, if you raise your hand, um, you you can also uh, ask questions in person that way. Um, so for now, I'd like to um, welcome our speaker this afternoon, Huang Hui Han, who's uh, in uh, Richard Mitchell Moore's lab at uh, UC Davis. Um, Ron Hui is, uh, I'm delighted to say, is an early career researcher who is in the fifth year of a PhD. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand over. Thank you. Thank you all. Hello. Hello, everybody, friends and family, and the rest of the audience. <laughs> uh, my name is Ron Hui. Uh, today I'll be telling you about um, drone phenotyping and machine learning enable discovery of loci regulating daily floral opening in lettuce. So this is a paper uh, we recently published on Journal of Experimental Botany. Um, so this is my lab. My name is Ronque, first of all, it's pronounced Ronque. It's like you went the wrong way, but you put a K in it, Ronque. So I'm currently a fifth year PhD student uh, at UC Davis in the plant biology graduate group. I'm a member of the Mijma lab. Uh, as of right now, I am a summer intern with Bayer Crop Sciences, uh, working also with vegetables. Uh, I have a master's in statistics also from UC Davis. And prior to that, I did my undergraduate in agricultural sciences at Cornell University. So a little bit about uh, our lab. We do genetics, genomics, and pangenomics of lettuce. Uh, in addition, we study lettuce resistance to a variety of diseases. Uh, we also do some pistachio work and there's genomics and genetics of omycete happening in my lab. So if you're interested, uh, please, visiting the please visit the following link, uh, mitchmorelab.ucdavis.edu. So that's where I did this work. Uh, so let's start with an, our topic for the day. So lettuce, so this research was done in the crop lettuce. Uh, there are a few market classes of lettuce that's popular um, around the world. Uh, the, what we're most familiar with is usually the crisp head, the um, uh, iceberg lettuce, followed by romaine lettuce, a uh, leafy type, the butterhead that's recently popular, and stem lettuce that's not very commonly seen in the US, but are popular um, in some other countries, for example, where I'm from, it's popular in China. And on the right uh, is a picture, two pictures actually, of the wild progenitor of lettuce. Um, it's actually a separate species. It's a Lactoca seriola that is reproductively compatible with cultivated lettuce, but morphologically look very different. It is a common weed uh, in many parts of the world uh, where I live, uh, Davis, California, this is seen everywhere on the roadside. Uh, wild lettuces are sources, good sources of resistance, um, many resistance genes for cultivated lettuce. So about the trick today, lettuce is, lettuce belongs to the Asteraceae family or the Compulsi family. It is a species of angiosperm. So it, what it means is that it flowers. Uh, so this is what a lettuce flower looks like. It's really, really small. It's about one centimeter in diameter, um, less than half, less than half of an inch in diameter. It's really not the most impressive flower, but if you zoom in, it's actually quite complicated because a lettuce, each what we call a lettuce, is actually an inflorescence of multiple individual flowers. So this is not one flower. This is a cluster of multiple flowers that together look like one single flower. So in this flower head, what we call a capitulum, uh, each single one of these is an individual flower. Um, and it is a perfect flower, as in it has the lower part is fused tube of anthers. And then on the top is the stigma, so the female parts, the male part, and here's the petal, and here's the ovary, and that's a developing seed. 
So in Lettuce, this interesting trait that we were able to observe was that there is this temporal differential of floral opening. So when we look at different genotypes of lettuce, some of them open earlier on in the day, while others open later in the day. So shown here is a collection of lines developed from crossing the top line with the bottom line. So the top line, what we call PI251246, is what we call an early opening line. So this flower is actually open early in the morning. So here from left to right, is a time series of pictures taken at one hour intervals. So starting here is 8 a.m. We can see this PI line reaches its peak opening at around 9 or 10 a.m. And it begins to close gradually as the day continues. And then on the bottom here, we have the late opening parent, which if you see here, shows no signs of opening throughout the entire morning and begins to open only around 12 o'clock and it continues to open throughout the rest of the afternoon. And, and you can see at around 4 p.m. it shows signs of closure. And then when we cross the two, it's their progenies show a gradient of different floral opening time. So if we look at this line 153 here, it peaks about, it starts to open at about 11, begins to close after that. And then this 51 also around 11 or 12 o'clock, 221 definitely peaks at 12 and then these ones extend into the afternoon. So this interesting trait reminds me of a concept that I learned at school that is called a flower clock. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this concept. So a flower clock is a garden plan initially proposed by Carl Linnaeus. So the idea is that if you plant different plant species that open or close their flowers at different times of the day, you'll be able to look at your garden and tell the time of the day it is. So this idea was published in 1751 and it has an interesting name that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, but this idea has been in existence for a long time to be able to tell the time of day based on the floral opening and closure um, of different plant species. In this case, what we're, interested is, what we're interested in is, are we able to build a flower clock with lettuce? Just one species with different genotypes of this one species of lettuce. So shown here side by side on the left and right are two different recombinant um, inbred lines of, this, of uh, the population I just talked about. So we made a cross between the er an early opening line and the late opening line. And we can see that we were able to observe this um, opening time differential from the field. So at eight o'clock, neither line shows floral opening. At nine o'clock, this right clock shows floral opening, but the left clock is pretty silent. At 1030, the left one is beginning to open while the right one is beginning to close. So we know that this is a feature that we're able to score from the field. Based on this observation, we designed an experiment. So we planted this population of 236 different lettuce lines developed from a cross between an early opener and a late opener. Um, so for people who are not very clear, uh, recombinant inbred lines are developed from crossing two different lines and then taking that F1 hybrid and self that for multiple generations. So we'll be able to get a collection of uh, closely related, of lines that share the same pair of parent, but are phenotypically and genetically different. So after obtaining the 236 lines, we genotyped them. Uh, we genotyped them using uh, a, a GBS method, which takes a, a selection of uh, markers from the entire genome and we were able to obtain 17,000 SNF markers uh, of the genotypes of all 236 lines. And then after genotyping this population, we planted them in the field. So we planted them in Davis, California, right here in June of 2019. So this was a long day experiment. This experiment was done during the summer. And then Lettuce is a long day plant. So naturally it tends to flower earlier under long day condition when the 
uh, hour of time, day is longer than the hour of night. So it was conducive for flowering. We planted one genotype per plot and two plot in the entire, in the entire experiment. So the two plots are organized in two uh, randomized complete plots, um, each of them consisting of all the plots representing the genotypes. Later on, we'll be able to see an aerial, aerial picture of the field, which will hopefully help you understand what the experimental setup looks like. So now that we know we can score this phenotype from the field, we want to be able to score this reliably instead of hiring an army of undergrads to flood the field and tell me what time of the day each plot reached peak flowering, according to their opinion. So in order to achieve this um, high throughput, low cost phenotyping for this temporal phenotype, we deployed a drone. So we mounted on this drone a webcam and a multi-spectral camera. We flew this drone over the field at one hour intervals, starting at nine o'clock. Um, so this uh, two o'clock time point, we had a technical error. The drone flew over the field, but did not um, take any pictures. So we unfortunately had to drop a time point, but it turned out that the rest of the time point were sufficient enough to give us a phenotypic signal. So what happens as the drone flies over the, over the field is that they take these pictures of the, of the, of the field at a couple second intervals, which results in about 2,300 images per time point. And then within these images, we can see that they capture these ground control points. We were able to take uh, the GPS coordinate of these control points and using the fixed GPS coordinate of these control points, we were able to stitch all of these field images together into an entire field. So these are the raw images with the ground control points. Uh, we use the software called PIX4D help, uh, with the help of, uh, of our collaborators. Here is an image of the field. It's not very clearly shown, but in these blue boxes are the ground control points. We have these ground control points. So that is an, an image of the field. So as I told you, I'll be able to tell you more about the experimental setup from this. So this is a single plot. It looks like that. It consists of 20 plants. Um, and that's one single genotype that's planted within this plot. And then within this block, there exists 236 plots with 236 unique genotypes. And then on the top and the bottom are two complete randomized blocks. So these plots are randomized differently in the top and in the bottom. So on the left here is a zoomed in picture of the field. You, if you look at it, you'll be able to see these yellow dots. And if you remember what a lettuce flower looks like, these are exactly lettuce flowers. Um, so fortunately, the two plants, the two gene, the parental lines we planted both display their flowers on top of the canopy. So we we're able to see the flowers very clearly through these aerial images. So these yellow plots correspond to flowers. And then intuitively, we know that these green patches are vegetative uh, lettuce tissues. And then on the background, these gray things are just ground. So we have these aisles of ground. Um, so in order to really score this phenotype, to look at the fluctuation of flowers within these, within these um, aerial images, these, because we have one um, field image per time point, in order to really see the fluctuation of floral pixels over time, we actually took a sample of about 1500 pixels of each kind of these pixels and manually labeled them. And then we look at their distribution. So, we, so every time we take a pixel from an image, we're able to, we have a, a numerical readout for that data point. So it has a, a hue value, has a saturation value, and it has a funnily called value value. So these, three numbers together describe the color of the specific pixel we pick out. So we look at the numerical 
distribution of these numbers. So we were, we were able to see that these floral pixels, these vegetative pixels, and these brown pixels are actually quite distinct from each other. This gives a, gave us confidence that we're able to process this image, dig, process image um, computationally and be able to tell the floral pixels from the vegetative or the ground pixels. So what we did is we took half of the data that we manually labeled, we fed them into five different machine learning methods to see if we can automatically tell these three kind of pixels apart. So we tried three different machine learning methods, and then we tested the efficacy of machine learning classification using the rest of the test set. So if you remember, we manually labeled 1500 pixels of each kind. We fed half of them to train the models. We tested the models using the other half that the models have never seen. We compared the accuracy of prediction once we fed them the test set. And it turns out that support vector machine method was able to achieve an accuracy very close to 100%. So among all the test pixels we fed it, it was able to tell them apart very accurately. So we decided to deploy the support vector machine model that we trained. So using the support vector uh, machine model that we trained, we feed this entire field image into the model and ask the model to tell me which one of these pixels are floral. And this is the output of the model. So every dot here that is white uh, was false colored uh, based on the classification result of the support vector machine um, model. So this machine tells me these are the floral pixel on this image at this time point. And if we look at all of these false colored images side by side along the time axis, we can see the fluctuation of floral opening and closure throughout the course of the day. So on the top, we can see that this plot didn't have many pixels, 10, at some at 11, at a lot at 12, and had nearly none at one o'clock. So we know that this plot definitely reached its peak opening somewhere between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock, probably closer to 12 o'clock. And then here we can see this plot had a lot of pixels in the morning, fewer at 11, but fewer again at 12 and nearly, any, nearly nothing at one. So we know that this plot peaked at 10 a.m. or before. So after we counted the pixels per plot and um, adjusted them by the maximum number, of, maximum number of floral pixels that's ever appeared on that plot, we were able to create this fluctuation um, um, line plot for each one of the for each one of the plots that were planted in the field, and to our very pleasant surprise, uh, the two blocks of this example uh, genotype corresponded to each other almost perfectly. So we can see that in both plots, in plot one, the top plot and the bottom plot. The, the floral pixels begin to show up at 10 o'clock, reached a maximum count at 11 o'clock, begins to decrease at 12, further decrease at one o'clock, and disappeared at three and four o'clock. If you remember the, the two o'clock, 2 p.m. Um, data point was missing. So this excellent correspondence between the two plot blocks gave us confidence that this we were able to uh, replicate each other with the two blocks and the method that we use to capture floral pixel is indeed reliable. However, if you look at, if you take a closer look at this plot, you can tell that although this thing reached its peak uh, floral opening at 11 o'clock, it clearly had more floral pixel counts at 12 o'clock over 10 o'clock. So if we're, if we are to um, dissect the process, we'd probably say that this thing reached its peak opening sometime between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock instead of between 11 and 10. So how do we really capture this nuance rather than be, look at this and say, I think it's sometime between 11 and 12. 
How do we do this in an automated, reproducible, and unbiased fashion? And fortunately, uh, Bayesian statistics is here to help. If we assume that the floor opening and closure events are symmetric, temporally symmetric to one another, we're able to fit a bell-shaped, what we usually call a Gaussian shaped or a normal shaped um, curve over this, um, over our data and be able to say that our model predicts a peak opening between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. And this method is unbiased and reproducible. So we will use this uh, parameter that I, would, I called tau k uh, to describe the peak opening of each line. So in order to fit this model, we have to do a little bit of math. We have to come up with a function that describes the shape of this curve. And this is what that function looks like. If you're familiar with normal distribution, you know it is e to the power of negative uh, whatever your x, um, your x axis variable is, minus its mean um, squared. And this is your, uh, the widths of the distribution, uh, your variance. So this is the function that describes the shape of this curve. And in order to be able to fit a model, we have to allow errors. So we fit an error term, assume this error term follows a normal distribution. So in order to run this Bayesian model, we need some priors. In this case, the priors are very, very weakly regulating. Uh, so the tall K is the middle of the day. So we're saying that prior to running this model, we assume all the lines open in the middle of the day. And we allow the model to tell us if it's before the, the middle of the day or it's after the middle of the day. And then we assume positive numbers for um, uh, the rest of the parameters. And then we look at the results. And we see that by plotting the actual number with the predicted model together, we can see that we were able to achieve some excellent fits with our model. And again, the two plots were able to, uh, the two plots, if you remember the two replicate of the experiments, uh, are true replications of one another, as in they capture the same information, although despite being obtained independently. So here is our early opening parent. You can see it peaked early. And here at the bottom is our late opening parent. You can see it peaked late. And then the lines in the middle reached peak opening at different times of the day. And if we look at the correspondence of the two plots with each other, we can see that they correspond well with each other, except for a few outliers. We take the mean of the two plots and look at the phenotypic distribution, exactly what time of the day did the plants uh, reach its peak opening. And we can see that it's roughly a normal distribution. And if you are strict about this and run an analysis, you can see it's actually uh, a lighter tail than normal distribution. It's more tightly distributed than a normal distribution but it follows the bell shape. The early parent flanked by the early parent and the late parent are the progenies that open anywhere in the middle of the day. Using this phenotypic distribution, we combine this phenotype with our genotype information. Because if you remember, we had 17,000 SNP markers for every line in this population. Combine these two information, we're able to obtain the genetic loci that uh, control this phenotype. And if here is um, on the y-axis is a lot of odd score uh, for each marker um, controlling this phenotype. And we can see that there are two very significant markers that are strongly associated, linked to this phenotype. One of them is on chromosome two, the other one is on chromosome eight. And if we, pl if we plot, uh, if we separate the, uh, all possible genotypic distributions on these two loci, we can see that the phenotype uh, tends to follow the combination. When we have, when both, uh, when on both loci, we have the early opening parent allele, the plants tend to open earlier in the day. Whereas when we have, uh, 
when we have the late opening parent allele on both of the loci, uh, the plants tend to open much later during the day. And if we were to take a closer look at these loci, we named them QDFO 2.1 and QDFO 8.1. DFO stands for daily floral opening. Um, they each flank <clears throat> about uh, a few median base pairs in length, and they explain uh, less than 20% of the phenotypic variance. And together they explain more than 30% of the phenotypic variance. Um, so within, within each of the QTLs, we're able to look at how the parents differ in terms of their uh, DNA sequence. And we identify genes within the QTL regions that also contain um, non-synonymous mutations between the two parents. And then within DFO 2.1, as an example, we found two genes that we identify as prominent candidate genes for this locate for this phenotype. Uh, the first gene has non synonymous single nu nucleotide variant between the two parents, and the second gene had uh, more significant variant variations between the two parents. So, the top gene is um, a circadian clock gene. Uh, the expression of this gene is circadianly controlled. Because floral opening is a, a daily event, we believe that uh, it is highly possible that this gene is associated with the circadian clock. And on the bottom is a, a ubiquitin activity related gene. So because we know that floral opening is a quite um, impressive locomotion event because the petals have to go through uh, really big movements a lot of times these big movements are controlled by uh, ubiquitin related activities. So we think this, um, this gene is also likely to uh, contribute to this phenotype. And one other question that some of our audience may have is that is floral opening related to flower opening? Uh, is floral opening related to flowering time? So when we talk about flowering time, we usually refer to what time of the season uh, a specific plant begins to flower at. So does it flower earlier in the season? Does it flower uh, later in the season? Whereas with floral opening time, we're talking about within a day. Does it open early in the day or later in the day? So are these two phenotypes somehow correlated? Are they regulated by similar pathways? So here you can see is a circus plot of all reported floral opening time loci in lettuce. This is also um, a paper published by our lab. So feel free to check it out uh, over at uh, Frontiers in Plant Sciences. Uh, but here is a summary of all the floral opening um, QTL in lettuce. Uh, sorry, all the flowering time QTL in lettuce. So does do our floral opening QTL uh, overlap with these um, flowering time QTL. So if we overlay this circus plot with the location of our two um, uh, floor opening loci, we can see that this one is approximately the same location at this as this uh, flowering time loci hotspot. But over here at DFO 8.1, it seems like it's not, it does not overlap with any known QTLs but here we see some partial overlap. So it is possible, this does not exclude the possibility that these two are regulated by uh, the same pathway or the same part of pathways at some point, but it also suggests that um, flora opening, it has its own independent regulation uh, that is different from flowering time regulation. So with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And I am very happy to take any questions you guys may have. So um, thank you very much for a really uh, interesting talk. So at this point, I'd like to um, ask if there are any questions from the floor. And I can already see one hand is up. So I'll let our moderators uh, uh, unmute uh, Aaron, I think. Oh, that hand has gone down again. <laughs> So Aaron Rosenfeld, did you have a question? Uh, 
I guess not. <laughs> okay, so uh, perhaps I could kick off then and, and, and maybe start. So, I mean, obviously, if you're thinking about a flower is there to be pollinated, so you might expect that to evolve to just sit open all day, right, when the pollinators are around. So, so why, you know, what are the evolutionary drivers for this behaviour of the flower opening and, and closing at different times in the day? And, and you know, what are, the, what are the costs, I guess, of having an open flower? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So actually, when we discuss this phenotype within the lab, we believe that this different different opening is likely driven by pollinator activities because the two parents are from very different origin. The later opening parents from a much colder area. So we believe that the pollinators might be active in later on in the day. That's why it's evolved to be later opening. Um, but in terms of the cost of an open flower, um, I have not thought about it systemically, systematically, but I can see if you have an open flower, it's more likely that your reproductive part's gonna be eaten okay. by a, say, a small bug. Sure. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then I guess a follow-up to that is, so what might be, what, what do you think of the environmental cues that actually that, that lead to that opening at, at certain times in the day? And, mm -hmm. and, and could, the, could it also be a, a, an insect or a, the presence of a pollinator or the landing of pollinators on the plant? Could that, mm. could that be something that might drive that or? Uh, that's a very good point. I, I've not, I don't believe so. I tend to, so when I think about ex, uh, environmental cues, I'm sure there are plants that would sense uh, like uh, mechanical forces that are pressing on the flower that would cause them to open. I think that's definitely possible. Uh, there actually exists a lot of diversity in terms of floral opening mechanism. Um, because if you look at the floral opening behavior itself, lettuce, each lettuce flower only opens for a single day. And then it just closed permanently and focuses on rearing that seed. And then there are a lot of plants that would open and close. And for, on the next day, open again and close again. So there's really big diversity in terms of how flowers open. Um, but in terms of common factors that tend to regulate these behaviors, um, sunlight is definitely one of them. So uh, plants tend to open their petals when the sun is out, unless it's a night opening plant. Uh, so and that, and a lot of that is regulated by um, uh, water pressure. So a higher temperature also tend to, also tend to affect water pressure and affect flower opening. So in lettuce, we know that when it's uh, a cloudy day, the plants tend to open later. So when it's a sunny day, they open uh, earlier. So it's definitely regulated, directly regulated by sun. But whether that's achieved through photosynthesis, you know, you know, like maybe um, photosynthate accumulation, or it's regulated by water pressure, or it's through temperature, that there's no conclusion in terms of how the sun regulates that. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm gonna open, uh, offer uh, the questions to the floor again um, before I dive in with a supplementary. Uh, no, nothing in the text box. I can't see any hands up. Uh, so I will ask another question then. Um, so, I mean, this is more of a technical question. So, I mean, and you perhaps partly answered this or, or perhaps made, made the question more pressing. So you say that the, 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 the lettuce flowers only open for a single day. Yes. So how on earth did you manage to coordinate 256 reels <laughs> to all open on the same day or, so, or, or uh, to all open on the same day to actually take these images? Excellent question. That's really, that's a great question. So each individual lettuce flower only opens for a day, but um, we're lucky. This, this population is actually incredibly proliferous, as in it has many, many individual flowers. Okay. So for each individual flower that only opens for the day, the next day they'll have a new batch ready to open. So for any given line of lettuce, it'll stay flowering 
for a window of a few weeks. Okay. So it'll continue to put out new flowers every single day. Uh, so that's did why you I have to do any correction then for flower density? I mean, obviously you measure a number of pixels, right, within a within within you within your um, plot, but well, that's going to depend on the flower density. Yeah, exactly. So different. That's excellent question. <laughs> so so each plot will have a different maximum density. Okay. Let's say this plot is more uh, reproductively active than the plot next door. So this plot is going to have a higher maximum number of pixel on that day. So when we plotted the, the fluctuation, we've adjusted all of these numbers by the maximum number of pixels that were observed within the day. So everything reaches a one at their peak or open. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, again, I'm just looking to there's any more. I mean, I've got loads more questions I want to ask, right? But I want to, I want to give other people an opportunity. <laughs> um, and again, I can't, oh, hang on, yes, we do have uh, one from um, Anna, Anna Muchich, I think it is. Uh, is this something you want to unmute and ask yourself or, or would you prefer? Sure, uh, yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, cool talk, Ronque, good job. Um, I was curious about the uh, machine learning methods that you used. How did you select the five that you tested and where did those come from? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, <clears throat> so machine learning. <laughs> there are different um, things people use machine learning for. So some people use it for more of a regression method, as in you want to predict a quantitative number at the end. So this, the, this, in this case, we want to use machine learning for classification purposes. We want to be able to feed uh, the pixel uh, numbers as I said, their numerical representation of the color of a pixel. We want to feed the numerical representation of each pixel into the map model and have the model spit out a class for me. Is this a flower? Is this a plant? Is this pixel a, a dirt, you know, a, a grain of dirt? So, so we're looking specifically for classification machine learning methods, less of the numerical prediction regression type of machine learning methods. Um, so these are popular classification methods. So there's nothing special about this collection about five of five. It's really the top five we could come up with when it comes to classification machine learning methods. Uh, support vector machine is probably the most popular method when it comes to cases like this. So it wasn't a surprise when it came up top, um, but linear discriminant analysis also and Kenya's neighbors also perform well in certain cases. So these are just popular classification methods. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've also got, we've got a ball rolling now. So there's a question from uh, Isabel. Isabel, do you want to unmute and ask that question, or would you prefer me to ask it on your behalf? No, I can unmute. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, so my question, you know, you touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, there's the difference of uh, different varieties of lettuce have different flowering times. So how did you uh, control for flowering times when you selected your parents? And in your um, population, did you see differences in the number of days to flower between um, different lines? Yes, we did. The, the short answer is yes. So I'm, uh, can we pull up the two French lines? So in addition to being opening early in the day and opening later in the day, these parents do behave differently in terms of the number of days that they take to flower. So the top line, the PI, is also the faster uh, flowering line. And then the bottom one is the later flowering line. So the, the PI uh, flowers. I, I can't, I'm, I'll be making up numbers, but yes, they do differ in terms of the number of days they take to flower. So, and in addition, we did do a QTL mapping for the number of days it takes for these for this um, population to flower. And the loci was different in this population than the DFO 2.1 and 8.1. So the locus that controls floral flowering time 
in this population is actually located on chromosome four. Um, so the reason why we selected both of these parents is because um, in comparison to what we consider a normal lettuce, these are both early open, early flowering lines. They both kind of like put out flowers within fewer days when you compare that to a um, common um, iceberg or romaine. So these are both, they both tend to flower early, but within early, the PI25 tend to flower a little bit earlier. But fortunately, they do have an overlapping window. So the progenies do flower within the same window of a few months. So we were able to get a day when everybody was flowering. So we were able to score their floral opening time on that day. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't see anything else coming up on the up on the chat. Um, so perhaps I can ask another technical question. I mean, so so you you did you find that, that you had to correct for you know for, for your pixel identification and for your pixel um, classification, right? I mean, obviously you're flying at, at different times of the day when you're going to have different external lighting conditions. Mm -hmm. You may have a different pitch on your drone. Your drone may be at a different height. I mean, how do you correct for all of these external factors? Great question. So if I, there is a, a, a figure next to this figure that's shown here in the paper. So we, we looked at all the pixels together. So we scrambled the floral pixels, the vegetative pixels, and the ground pixel, removed the labels, and we looked at, so because we took random samples from each time of the day, when we did this 1500 pixel sampling, uh, we were able to look at their distribution at different, within different images to see if we see a significant shift in the distribution as the time was changed. And it turned out that distribution were very similar to each other. We did not see a significant shift towards, you know, one end of the spectrum as the day progressed. So on one end, if we just were lucky that our data was high quality, that that helped with the analysis. And you, and you did that classification from your RGB camera, right, rather than your multi-spec, or did you need yeah. the multi-spec as well? It's the it's the RGB. So we were wondering if the multi-spec you know, was able to add information or the RGB uh, would not have enough information for the classification, but it turned out RGB was sufficient. We didn't need the near infrared or the, uh, I don't even remember what the other one was, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> RGB was turned out to be sufficient. Okay, thanks. So um, we are pretty much on time now. Um, so I'm just gonna give one last opportunity for questions from the floor. And if we don't have those, um, I'd like to thank you once again for your uh, really interesting presentation. I'd like to encourage people here to have a look at that in uh, JXBOT um, volume 72, number eight. Um, and I'd like to uh, invite you to, to check out the SEB website for the, uh, for the upcoming JXBOT uh, seminars. Thank you again. Thank you.